thanks for being here. Thanks for tuning in on the live stream presently and in the future. Uh, my name is Eve Parker Finley. I'm the symposium director for POP. I'm so excited about today's workshops. Uh, Kim and I talked about doing this day of events like months ago, and now it's finally happening. So, so exciting. We'd really like to thank Music Declares Emergency, Chrissy Quebec, um, for making this day possible. I don't want to take up any more time. I'd love to hand it off to Tanya Gill and get this work sh get this panel on green touring and live performance started. Please welcome our panelists. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Eve. Um, so my name's Tanya Gill and I'm moderating today. Um, I'm a uh, piano player, composer, improvising musician from Toronto and uh, I also have worked helping organize climate strikes uh, in Toronto and with musicians coming out to the climate strikes and I'm a board member of Music Declares Emergency and uh, I'm thrilled to be moderating. I think I'll start by um, introducing these amazing people. Um, so we have Laurence over here. Oh wait, there, okay, <laughs> so now all of a sudden, my, okay, hang on one second. I'm gonna get myself better organized for this. Uh, <laughs> Laurence. La Femme Bone. Yes. And um, Laurence lives in Montreal. She is um, a, a musician with the band Milk and Bone, Juno yes. award winning band. Yes, and we are. Yes. <laughs> and a uh, producer as well. And uh, also a solo artist under the name of Soft Fabric. And uh, Laurence is also um, an environmental activist who co founded ACT, which is. Um, Artist, ci artist citizens on tour, and uh, they promote eco-friendly practices in show business. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Did good. <So. laughs> um, and also, uh, this is actually Devin on the far left there. Devin Hardy, um, who has um, managed the adaptation of Julie's Bicycle Creative Green Tools to the Canadian context. So Julie uh, is is an environmental specialist, a background in environmental sciences um, and, and water resources management. Worked in that field for several years and then decided to pursue a career in the arts and began working on sustainable initiatives. So she is now the program director for uh, Creative Green Tools Canada. Um, and uh, uh, also, also is, um, uh, she has a passion for the arts governance and is a secretary of the board of directors of Mainline Theatre and saint Abois Montreal Fringe Festival. Yeah, so um, we will learn more about Creative Green Tools Canada on this panel and, and we have a real expert here, which is fantastic. Um, Marie Zimmerman. Marie is from Guelph, uh, just outside of Guelph. She is the executive director of the Guelph Jazz Festival, which uh, really... Hillside. I meant to say Hillside. <laughs> Hillside Festival happens in Guelph. I just played at the Guelph Jazz Festival, but Marie is from the Hillside Festival. <laughs> Hillside Festival. Hillside Festival. Um, she uh, is the executive director. They are a carbon neutral festival, and we will talk more about the many things we can learn from the experience of the Guelph Festival. Um, uh, Marie um, has worked for five Canadian arts festivals in music, dance, jazz, film, and literature, acting as artistic director, publicist, HR consultant, emergency plan architect, strategic planner, and treasurer. She is one of the founding members of the Guelph Fab Five, a collective of local arts festivals. I'm wondering if maybe I could start by um, asking Laurence to, to... I'm Laurence. <laughs> I'm, it's so funny because I know you're Devon and I know you're Laurence <laughs> and it's actually just because I'm on stage that my brain just short-circuited. So that's it's the all truth. Chairs, but yeah, we should, <laughs> you could chairs. switch chairs. Yeah, we should switch chairs. It's all good. <laughs> this is Laurence. Yeah, yeah. That is Devon. Laurence, do you want to start by talking about what you've been up to and how you've been helping people address that sort of problem? Yeah, of course. Um, it, and it's quite funny that you, you, you talk about this kind of scene of after shows and festivals because that was exactly the moment where I, I figured that I had to do something five years ago, well, six years ago, but ACT is now five years old, um, was after a show where I, I would see this kind of behavior of like, uh, 
I don't know, it was like 20 half drank water bottle, plastic water bottle on stage and just people putting them in trash. And I was like, I feel like a lot of artists are speaking up and asking, um, com uh, publicly committing their themselves to doing more, but we're not really. <laughs> and I felt like this the, the industry was a bit hypocrite. Um, and so I started looking for, for tools. I was like, I, I don't want to be part of this. I want to try to, at, th at the moment I was, I was thinking, I want to try to change my behavior or maybe my band's behavior on tour, uh, would try to find tools online. And uh, at the moment there weren't a lot of things except Julie's Bicycles in the UK. But I was like, is there something adapted to Quebec or Canada? Is there something in France that I could share with my teams? Um, and there wasn't much. And so I, uh, I thought I can either stay frustrated and continue that way or help, like start creating something that is adapted for Quebec reality uh, that could eventually be used um, widely uh, ac across Canada maybe. Um, so we started at home in Quebec um, and at the beginning the mission was really to help uh, give tools and ideas to touring artists on how they can change the, their behavior. What are their power? What are their powers also uh, as artists towards venues? What can they ask? How can their demands become um, a, a tool to to make this indu industry change? So one of the things we started with was we have this power of asking how we want the gr green green room to be, and that that is something that is going to help start a dialogue between the venues and the artists, uh, which felt very um, exciting and needed because I think uh, as artists, we tend to be kind of in this little bubble and working only with like our labels and our close team. But I mean, there the venues, the festivals, the bookers, uh, we're all working together on the same thing. And this is also why with time we decided that our mission needed to be bigger than just touring artists and now we work with labels helping them organize and we have uh, uh, accreditation where we we have like level like silver bronze uh, gold levels and we help uh, a bunch of um, in um, industry organizations uh, uh, like booking agents uh, whatever you are we can help you structure your business and have this long-term and short-term plan on how can you make your business and your working relationships more uh, eco-friendly, um, more thoughtful, and have a, a plan to do so and keep making moves and, and, and getting better every year. So yeah, that's a little portrait of where it started and where we're at right now. It's very inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> It is because I have thought about these things myself, but I would be, I have, I, I mean, I decided to instead support the striking kids, but. That's also, <laughs> but I mean, I, and I <laughs> but think uh, one, one of the things that I, I also want to say is that we're, we're talking about the, 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 the music industry, uh, the, the show business industry in my case, but it's, it's also just a little reminder that Everybody has a power if you start working in your in your field, mm -hmm. and that's something I, I like to to rem remind people. And when you surround yourself, like things can become bigger. Exactly, than exactly. And I think partly why I hadn't got yet to tackling what you tackled is because it it felt very difficult to do it. So I but think it, it's it is very also. alone. It alone it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've met you and you've been working with a few other people. Oh yeah, yeah. But um, so that that makes me. Uh, and you're mentioning uh, creating ways people can measure their progress, and I think that's uh, um, something we can chat about a bit more when we talk about creative green tools as well. It's so um, important. So I noticed on your website, artists can. Um, uh, there's, there are templates for how they could create a, a green rider. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was uh, going to ask Marie, do you have our, uh, so Marie, uh, again, at the Guelph Jazz Festival, uh, ah, pardon Hillside. me, <laughs> Hillside Festival. Um, at the Hillside Festival, like, um, can you talk about your experience working on similar issues? Do you have artists who show up with green riders or, or what's your experience working on, um, working with artists, I guess, when they arrive at the festival? For the most part, it's really positive, but I've never seen a green rider ever. Um, but artists um, 
our ideal artist comes with um, a vegetarian appetite uh, and a water bottle and an openness to uh, having their dishes washed and, uh, and returned to them. So um, they're also open to traveling from uh, where we're accommodating them, be that at the campground or the hotel, uh, via shuttle bus, uh, so that we don't have all kinds, like 400 artists driving out to the Guelph Lake Conservation Area. We shuttle them and then we transport them by boat we, uh, just over the water to the island. Um, it's very romantic, but it's also <laughs> to keep it's also to keep people off uh, the island or keep actually vehicles off the island because we see the island as a metaphor for the world. You know that it's it's finite and we need to treat it well and we want to honor pedestrians on that space and dancers and <laughs> that kind of thing. So. Um, yeah, so we've never seen a green rider, uh, but we do normally deal with artists who are um, very happy to be in that space. I think that there are some some people who are on tour, though, and I have to remember how stressful it can be to be on tour for artists who have heavy-duty flights here, there, and everywhere, and uh, they arrive, and you know, the only thing we get is like, why are, why is there no meat here? And you know, you can show that graph that's really astonishing right about you know what the carbon footprint of beef is or something but we don't do it that way because we're not even though we have an educational imperative it's more about uh, being in an immersive environment and sort of demonstrating quietly what we do we don't demonstrate with placards as it were um, so yeah so we we sort of gently say well if that's what you would like you can go over to the food pavilion and purchase purchase that and you know we'll compensate you or whatever. But no, for the most part, um, artists are, are really happy and they're surprised and, um, and feel grateful that they're in that kind of environment. And, and for people who aren't familiar with what um, the kind of environment overall, uh, can you talk a little bit more about, the about what Hillside does, how you have achieved a carbon neutral festival? Like, it's a big uh, question. Yeah, so I'm just thinking, well, the breaking down the categories of places, and we can move over to also, maybe for both you and and Devin, we could talk about presenters. What are, th what are the ways that they can reduce their carbon footprint in live performance situations? Mm -hmm. Do you want to take that, Devin? Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, uh, many different ways. I don't know, I'm trying to like think about it. Um, I mean, uh, obviously, um, offering like a space that's free of uh, plastic water bottles and unnecessary waste is a big one. Um, we're also seeing a lot of um, presenters and artists starting to take more, um, uh, more responsibility of the way that people get to their venue. Um, we've seen over and over through research that audience travel is like by and large the biggest um, uh, environmental impact in the arts and culture sector. Um, m most of the time, um, and people kind of say like, well, you know, I don't have any control over that, so why should that be counted towards my carbon footprint? Um, but actually there are a lot of ways that people are starting to influence that, offering um, reduced ticket prices for um, like, uh, what's it called? Co-voiturage. Um, that's the one. Um, uh, English is my first language. I don't know why I forgot that. <laughs> um, uh, or like for biking or, you know, offering uh, a shuttle service to and from a site. Um, so, you know, that's a thing that we're seeing is really um, uh, like a, a growing initiative. And it's one of the reasons why in the Creative Green Tools we we do like include audience travel in footprints because it is like um, it is so massive and it is something that um, you can control if you're uh, creative. And I know like Laurence has done. Um, you, uh, I'm thinking about how I'm gonna approach this for the next tour. Yeah. Next tour, how are we gonna have this talk with our audience? Uh, so I'm not actively doing it, but I'm thinking about it right now. Maybe maybe on like having reduced tickets for. Uh, people who came on active tra transport or carpooling or whatever, but mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. But it's something you know. It's something that I didn't. I did not even know a year ago that the audience tra travel would had such th a big impact. 
So, and, and it's something that, that it's always true in, in these fields. Like we learn something new <laughs> every year, and so we have to adapt. And, but seeing this as something exciting and, a new, and when you have that knowledge and deciding to, okay, here's a new um, challenge. How can I adapt and make it exciting and fun for us, my team, but also the, the fans? How can this be a positive experience for everyone is a challenge, but I think it's 100% doable. And I guess uh, a, mom, a, a small question my mind goes to, how do you actually do that? Like, how do you, if you're selling ticket sales ahead of time, do you just say, are you taking a bus bicycle? This is your price and you honor honor system or are there ways of measuring? I mean, you, you actually keep track of how people arrive at your festival, right? Yes, we, we count um, the number of bicycles uh, that arrive and uh, we count the number of people on shuttle buses and we count the number of cars. And um, it's really tedious work, but um, all the volunteers rally and, and do this stuff because you don't know really what your baseline is and what you're trying to, um, what you're trying to fix unless you can measure it first. Right. Um, so should we talk more about how we can measure these things? Is that my segue? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so my program, uh, Creative Green Tools Canada, we um, offer a set of carbon calculation and reporting tools for the arts and culture sector um, that were specifically built for the arts and culture sector. Um, created, of course, first in the UK by Julie's Bicycle. Um, and then we adapted them to the Canadian context over two years, and now they are available and free to use in Canada for anyone in the arts and culture sector who would like to measure their carbon footprint. Um, and we felt like it was um, really important to have a framework like this in Canada. Um, it had been so successful in the UK, they saw like really drastic emission cuts in the arts and culture sector. Um, something like, you know, 41% emission reduction over a six year period or something. Wow. wow. Um, so, um, so we wanted to have a similar um, framework here because it, it is so important to, um, you know, I don't, even though like I run this program, I don't think that carbon footprinting is like the be all and end all, but it's like such a good starting point, especially like, you know, a lot of what I was hearing um, before, um, before we started the program from folks in the arts and culture sector was that like, I really want to be greener. I want to, you know, I want to lower my um, environmental footprint, but I don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, everything yeah. was so overwhelming. And like, you know, I saw a lot of like hyper fixating on things like, okay, well we have plastic straws. We have to get rid of the plastic straws. But like they were flying artists in from across the country or across the world or like, you know, their um, lighting systems were completely inefficient or, you know, things like that. So um, being able to like uh, calculate your carbon footprint and, uh, you know, like our platform, um, it makes your carbon footprint uh, visible in like a nice pie chart. And so you can see what the big piece of the pie is and you can use your, if you have limited resources to make a change, which most artists do have limited resources, um, you can like actually um, put your resources towards like a more efficient um, use of those resources and uh, make a bigger, um, emission cut. Right. And there, there's yeah. something that, I, if I can add something to that, is something that we've noticed a lot talking to a bunch of events and panels like that with people from the industry is that a lot of people are scared of not being perfect in this. Uh, and I, I think it's, I, it's, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to adapt. It's okay to not do everything when you start to have a plan over five years or, or something, as long as you start somewhere. Uh, a lot of people were like, well, what if I talk about, um, how do I say my, my démarche? Like, um, how do I talk about my um, impl implication my in, in, in this? Um, and, and people call me out for like not being perfect or something. Um, and I, I think there is this kind of, um, uh, fear of being called out for not being perfect um, that we have to 
to, to, to forget about, that we have to dismiss because um, I'm not perfect and I'm doing my best and some days I'm like, fuck, I bought these things that I, I, I didn't need it and it's new and I'm like, oh. And I mean, that's part of like being in this system. Like we're not gonna be perfect, but we need to start somewhere. And to I think it's a, a, a very big trap that a lot of people, we all fall in. But uh, yeah, so I just I just think that it's really nice to ha to know that these tools exist as a start point, and that there are a lot of people uh, and um, and organizations existing to help you create a plan, and it's okay to not like do everything because it, it's it also uh, also looks like a very very big mountain that you're like you're never gonna get there if you see it all at once. So to just have like a separate things and a plan makes it first more doable and achievable and exciting because you get to grow and 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 yeah anyway how, how was your experience getting started in this journey um i did not start the festival it started in 1984 and it was it was um started by m local musicians but they were also environmental advocates and so care of the land and stewardship of the land was always really central to what they did. So creativity is linked to, to the land. And um, so that makes it kind of easy to introduce green initiatives. And so Hillside has had tons of green initiatives in place for like over 20, 30 years. I think we were the first maybe in the country to introduce free water. Um, so we've also banned plastic water bottles that you just go and um, introduced sh shuttle buses and uh, cycling uh, brigades and that kind of thing. But, um, but it was so, so long ago like that all of these things started and, and Hillside has been so sort of independent and kind of like, yeah, I can do that sort of attitude and um, that we didn't really sign on to measuring our carbon footprint because it wasn't a thing. It was seemed more urgent to introduce yet another green initiative but then you end up in that funny place where people say, well, what's your carbon footprint? And you're like, uh, I don't know. Like, <laughs> we're, but we're doing these cool <laughs> things. And because we're grassroots, we didn't have either the money or the people to measure that. At least we didn't think we did. So about five or six years ago, I guess, we started saying, no, it was like 2014. I, uh, we started saying, let's get a baseline. And so we worked with Ian Garrett um, from York University and uh, we started uh, looking at different facets of the festival and we measured all kinds of things and uh, came up with uh, a carbon footprint after that. But we didn't, we feel like it had to be replicated year after year before we knew that it was consistent and therefore real, you know, and it wasn't just a mistake that uh, whatever. So we spent about five years doing that and um, and then what's really great about that and what's really great about the tools that Devon has um, is that uh, once you have that, it's, it's math. It's not so much work <laughs> on the ground. You're just doing math. You're estimating. And that makes it so much easier to, to manage, to calculate your footprint and to feel uh, sort of calm about it. If you have to think about, you know, managing um, like groups of volunteers to measure something, when really all it takes is one person sitting down with a calculator, like which, which are you gonna choose? <laughs> so I think uh, Devin's got a lot of really great answers. It's so, uh, that's great. It's a powerful story, I think, what Hillside has done. Um, and, and also you offer, it's, it's actually easy to get access into working with creative green tools you have. I know you mentioned a training program that you have. Yeah, so we have, um, we have monthly training sessions, um, it, one in English, one in French every month. Um, and so you can come and uh, they're free. You can come and learn about the Creative Green Tools. Um, you can sign up for the Creative Green Tools now. You just have to create a profile and it's a, it's a free platform. Um, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'm going to too. Um, <laughs> perfect, two more users. Um, if you go to uh, cgtoolscanada.org, you can access the tools from there um, and also find information about training and we have some other like educational workshops and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's easy to sign up and part of like um, 
the way in which they were created was they were designed to be simple. Um, and we kind of like, um, we're always, as we like, as we adapted the tools and as we're like looking to improving them, because that's another thing is that like, I don't feel like they'll ever be done. Um, they're always going to be, they're always going to continue to be updated and improved as the world changes and as we get feedback from the sector. Um, but as they were created, they were created to be simple. Um, and we're, so we're trying to like, um, we're trying to find that balance between uh, user friendliness and accuracy. Uh, because creating, uh, like doing carbon accounting that, um, uh, that works with like international carbon accounting standards like ISO 14064 and stuff like that. That's like extremely complicated. We can't expect like every small theater company or touring artist to be able to do that kind of thing. And like, you know, it often you're hiring consultants, it costs money. Um, so we do, uh, we do make assumptions. There's a lot of estimating involved. Um, but you know, if everybody's using a common platform and you're, so you're comparing yourselves to others with kind of like a common system and you're also comparing yourself to yourself year after year, like that's a really powerful thing. So, um, so and yeah. And, and it's, you're comparing yourself to, uh, other people whose names are not visible, correct? Like it's, yeah, yeah, it's exactly. A, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, you, I just was thinking, uh, people might go, oh no, are they people gonna know <laughs> I'm doing this well and that specific festival is doing that well, but it's it's anonymous, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you don't, Listed. nobody sees, like, yeah. nobody's gonna see your data but you unless you want to, um, unless you want to, to share your carbon footprint with others. Um, and, you know, eventually, the program has only been launched for a little while. Eventually, we'll have um, benchmarks so that you can compare yourselves to others, like other kinds of similar organizations or artists in the sector. Um, but again, all of all of the data that we'd be sharing publicly is all um, aggregate, anonymized data. So, um, you know, I think that when Laurence was talking about um, people feeling like shame or people not like um, feeling embarrassed that they're not perfect, um, like you know, perfect is, perfect is the enemy of good, and it's like perfect, like um, striving for perfection can really impede mm -hmm. progress. Like um, nobody, is, nobody is judging you for your carbon footprint. Um, I mean, unless you're, I don't know, <laughs> Jeff Bezos or something. But, um, you know, I'm on the topic <laughs> of um, perfection being the enemy of good, I, uh, I, I'm diving in here moderating this yeah, panel, and uh, I think I failed on uh, moderating a panel one-on-one -on -one in remembering to bring a watch or some kind of a timekeeping <laughs> piece up here. <laughs> so and I'm wondering if any, it's, it's 1141, thanks. I was gonna say, does anyone have a watch? They wanted to donate, <laughs> and I can keep my eye on things. Um, but if not, I'll just keep asking you, Kim. Uh, thanks. So um, um, that data, uh, I've, I've heard that in the UK, this kind of data has been collected and, and uh, policymakers, you know, arts, um, you know, government arts uh, people uh, can look at this and, and come up with like different kinds of granting structures or they can come up with different ways of enacting policy that responds to data. But in Canada, we're lacking data on the carbon footprint of the arts sector. Right? Yeah, we don't really have <coughs> any except for like, you know, um, uh, like companies that have had private audits that have chosen to make that data available, but we don't have any widespread data on the environmental impact of the arts and culture sector. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that like in the UK that's been so valuable because um, Arts Council England has like a decade's worth of data on the UK arts and culture sector. And um, they've been able to use that to uh, implement like targeted programming that actually targets the demonstrated needs of the sector and not just what they have a hunch might be good. Right. Um, and so we're hoping to have that eventually. Um, you know, like I said, we only, we launched in April, so we don't have that much data yet, but we're hoping that with more uptake, um, we'll be able to have that uh, wider data set um, cause that's like the data, um, the data piece that kind of goes from two sides. It's like, um, it's 
the tools exist to like empower the users and for the users to be able to um, see their carbon footprint, understand their carbon footprint, and act on that if they choose. But then there's also this wider collective data set that is like so, so powerful um, to be able to see, um, to be able to implement programming, see how the sector is responding to that programming and see what um, uh, like initiatives are effective. Um, so that's like, you know, one of the big dreams once we've um, grown and expanded and we have more users and more like educational programming and stuff like that, that's um, yeah, th hopefully something. Yeah, this data could be useful to so many people in so many ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, there's probably data coming in, in your, on your, I, I didn't ask uh, you this before, yeah. but. I mean, uh, we, d we don't have like specific data that we, it, we, and I'm really excited they exist because it's something we, we've been wanting to do with Ag for like five years and could never find the fundings to, and I'm, I'm like, yes, yeah. so someone <laughs> did it and managed to do it. So yeah. I'm, um, and actually Caroline, who is uh, one of the co-founder of Ag, Caroline Royer, helped uh, oh, uh, make this product. So, um, so we're super excited that this tool is available and, and it was much, much, much needed here. Yeah. Um, so congrats and on you're that. Working, you're working together. It's really a great uh, thing. Mm. It's amazing. Um, uh, I have a bunch, I have a few different thoughts, but um, I guess on the topic of um, government level uh, initiatives, um, maybe I'm changing tack a little on thinking about grants um, I, um, and about uh, the kinds of things that like if, well, I mean artists, artists apply for touring grants. I've thought about this before. If there was a budget line where I could say, you know, I have to spend this much more money because I want to travel by train. Um, and that was actually even encouraged. That would be a bit of a game changer. And then, you know, that's possible. That could be the same thing on the end of people applying for grants who are presenting. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say anything about that? Yeah, that to me is something that um, I think would be a game changer in the presenter programmer world. So. Um, uh, uh, federal grants and provincial, I'm uh, living in Ontario right now, uh, require you to um, address their priorities. So supposing their priorities uh, relate to accessibility. They're asking you, where are you at with uh, an accessible website? Is your office accessible? Are all of your venues accessible? Um, the same thing with programming, you know, uh, how are you addressing our priorities of indigenous people of color, uh, more women, this kind of thing. But nobody's asking about your environmental impact. Nobody is saying, can you tell us, you know, how much you, how many, uh, I don't know, kilometers uh, uh, you're flying artists in at and so on. And I think that if we had that, so many more people would be motivated to go to Devon's website, to go to your website, and to start saying, oh crap, I've got to make sure that I'm recording it, because nobody's holding them accountable for measuring what it is that they're doing. But if you're not going to get funding, or one of the criteria of the funding is that you really need to be here at this threshold, then I think it motivates so, much, so many more people to, to step up. So th that would be really good. I, I know that it's going to happen. Uh, we are having talks with people from grant uh, givers that are um, willing to add this to their criteria. Uh, I, I won't Ooh. say names right now because like it's not done yet. But I, uh, people are talking. Uh, pe people are are conscious that also. There is a cost to not taking actions, so this should be uh, a criteria in, in grant um, receivers uh, to, to have a plan, to have a structure, to have uh, to be uh, actively uh, as active as they can, or at least have a basic plan that they're, they're and it, it, it forces people to just think about it because it's easy to not think about it because the system right now like is not. Um, in a, in a, uh, it's not working in a way where you actively have to be uh, act, um, thinking about it. It's just like you can do pretty much anything. So I know 
there's our discussions with, with grant uh, givers. So hopefully it won't take like five years, but I, I know that more than ever people are like uh, conscious about th those things uh, on this level. That is exciting to me. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, see. we'll see. The grant organizations uh, but also, also asking like for this is yeah. and supporting it, I think it's a big deal. Yeah. And, yeah. and also, I mean, if I can just say, let's never forget the, the power we all have if you're asking for grants. Uh, Which we're very grateful for. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and oh yeah, big yeah. time. And um, we can also ha ask this to, to, to them, oh, why is there not this? Why, and, and as, as if more people talk about it and ask uh, uh, for it, it will come faster because they will feel the, the pressure and it doesn't make sense that it's not there already, you know? Uh, yeah. So have I the talk, <laughs> please. <laughs> have the talk. I have two simultaneous thoughts, totally different directions. One of them is, uh, I'll just say that um, the kinds of things that ha that you're mentioning that have been asked for, like accessibility and who's being represented, of course, like from an intersectional viewpoint on the climate crisis, those things are also very important to climate, right? And um, to, you know, how we have a fair society and how we can, you know, reach everybody. And, and so, of course, those things are totally important. And I know we're not downplaying those things in any way, but it's interesting to think what's there and what's not. And, but also your, your, your tools address some of those social con, um, aspects of climate to do with climate justice that aren't necessarily to do with carbon footprint, right? Is that true on your site? Yeah, yeah well, I mean, um, we really feel that like, um, uh, like the environment is, like environmental issues are inextricably linked to social issues. Yeah. Like um, environmental justice is like, you know, um, a huge part of what we, um, what we do, what we try to do. Um, so like when we, um, when we adapted the tools from the UK context to the Canadian context, um, it was really important for us to take into account like the cultural context of this country. Um, so we felt that, you know, if we were just like directly importing something from the UK and being like, this is what you use now, um, that wouldn't be an equitable system. So um, in the two years that we spent uh, studying and adapting the tools to this context. Um, we did a lot of consultation with indigenous communities to try to figure out how to make our platform and our programming um, inclusive and also how, how our programming could possibly be enriched by indigenous knowledge. Um, because, you know, it's like pretty much every environmental problem can be linked back to colonialism in, in some way. Um, uh, and so like in our, we have like an educational workshop series and uh, we alternate between bringing in speakers who are speaking from a Western perspective and speakers who are speaking from an indigenous perspective um, because it is so important to have like, to, um, to bring awareness to like different kinds of knowledge systems um, because you know, Western environmentalism can be very like is still very rooted in colonialism and, um, you know, can be very like um, uh, Eurocentric. And so, uh, so yeah, so that's something that like uh, we've, we've been working on a lot. That's exciting yeah. too. Um, uh, is it okay if I jump over to another subject? Because I think it, where yeah. are we at now with time is, uh, 11.52, because um, uh, the one other thing I was thinking about with touring is, uh, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine, musician, mm -hmm. uh, about doing this panel, and he said, uh, yeah, well, maybe people can address the fact that sometimes you fly across the country for a 45-minute showcase, and, uh, you know, how can you, how can we shift things so that that doesn't happen anymore? And I know um, of Bridget or other artists who, you know, maybe in a green rider, they're saying, if we're gonna go somewhere, we wanna spend a lot of time there. We wanna minimize the footprint from our, from our own travel um, or make the most value if we're gonna have to burn carbon to travel, really get a lot out of being there and don't travel unless there's really a good reason to do it. Um, and 
um, yeah, you had some thoughts on that subject, I think. But we were talking about you know, um, like uh, radius clauses, like from presenters. How can they how can they work together to help um, artists not land in one spot for a single gig? Yeah, so it's uh, complicated. Um, you know, Hillside operates using a triple bottom line. So you know, cultural, uh, economic, and environmental. Um, but uh, from you know, the sort of old model for programmers is that you fly in somebody and you get that performer mm -hmm. and uh, nobody else does, right? So you get that performer and that means that you're going to sell tickets. So you're doing well in terms of culture and economics because people value that. It's a rare performance and isn't this wonderful? The only problem is th that you're losing points. You get like an F on environmental because you've flown them in and that's that entire carbon footprint is on you. So how do you get around that? Um, what you do is try to do some block booking and some touring with other partner festivals uh, in the area, usually beyond the radius clause, you know, um, so that uh, we might uh, block book with uh, someone up nor in northern Ontario over uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba, Regina. And um, so what ends up happening, uh, ideally, is that the artist ends up getting a much more meaningful gig out of that because it's a series of gigs and they get paid for each and every one of them. And so then it's kind of like a shared carbon footprint. Okay, we're all in on this and we're all actually distributing this amazing artist culturally to these communities. And as an artist, if this happened more, it would be amazing on so many levels for us. The uh, exclusivity thing, I mean, we get it, but it's very annoying I I in that line of thinking. Um, it's restrictive and, and also like physically, um, money-wise and everything, it, it's, it takes a lot out of you to get to some somewhere. So just for one, one gig to fly or something. Uh, we we don't do that anymore because we're trying to be more conscious and 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 go by l uh, land tra traveling uh, much more than flying and I if we're to fly s somewhere it needs to be meaningful and worth it and we'll try to stay there longer and then but then with that comes also like your your um, your um, men mental health like not being in home for so long for some people it can be harder too so if people were willing bookers and distributors were willing to to be more working in tier teams a bit more it would be helpful for i think everyone <laughs> so yeah. this makes makes so much so much uh, sense and, and and it's a big 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 point of the industry that we're not talking a lot right now and 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 then it's hard something with the, the the schedules it's not always doable but at least if we start working more together and being conscious of that is a, would be a really, really great start. Yeah, <laughs> working together. <laughs> working together is a good thing. I know on your website you were talking about if you're trying to get started as any, an artist or an organization, and you mentioned this earlier, like just establishing your intention from the start. Yeah. Would you wanna? Yeah, yeah, uh, well, uh, so something that, um, that we, we tell people is uh, the, the first thing to do is to have the talk with your team on your, your mission, on, on your implication, and where is everyone willing to go, what is too much for someone, what is not enough for someone else, and find a common ground and make this um, something exciting for the team. Uh, prepare, so for example, for this door, we ha I, I, I worked, uh, I, I, write, I wrote an email to the band, the label, on like, okay, we want to do merch in a more conscious way. And that means we're going to pay more, so uh, to find the, the right um, fournisseur, where, where can we get this more uh, responsible merch, lo local, organic, blah, blah, blah. Uh, knowing that it's not perfect, ideally, like if we would, like we wouldn't make any item. But then, okay, knowing that we still need that money because we're not making that much. Blah, blah. So, trying to find like what is, what can we do, where can we cut, and where can we push. And uh, so, this talk is the first. Uh, like it, we've seen, we've seen how much it helps people get organized uh, when you start by that. Um, and then. Um, uh, 
what will be the first actions we're going to take, and then the ones we're not ready yet, well, make let's make sure that we can uh, try next touring or next year or whatever, or when we're more comfortable with the changes we've made on the road or uh, in our practices. Um, so this is the first thing, and then um, yeah, and 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 if I can uh, just tell you about something that I I think is very um, nice to know is that there's the, this uh, organization called Conseil Québécois des Événements Éco-Responsables. It's more a, f uh, it's a francophone organization, but they are now giving a lot of workshops on so many subjects for people in the industry. So if you want to organize at the office, if you want to know how do I organize an eco-conscious uh, uh, um, um, what whatever it is, a show or a festival, how how can I start? And they they're they're gonna give you the support. They're there for that. So this exists, and they have so many knowledge. How do I create uh, responsible merch and stuff like that? And this is a tool that we're we're gonna with Act we're setting up right now. So we're it's gonna be available very soon for the merch uh, thing because it's kind of hard to find. Um, I don't know the word for fournisseur in, in English, but um, yeah. Providers. Providers, or, um, yeah. yeah. Suppliers, Suppliers. that's the Thank one. you, yeah. that are responsible or better choices and that don't necessarily cost you like crazy money because it is more expensive. And yeah, so if, you, if you're, you're uh, curious about uh, having some support or um, teams to help you get organized, go, go check out for sure Conseil Québécois des événements co-responsables because they're pretty amazing for that. That's great. Thank you yeah, for yeah. offering it's a good that. It's everybody. a good start point with the creative tools, I think. Okay. Yeah, they uh, co-deliver the program. The CG Tools Canada is a program that's run by the Centre for Sustainable Practice in the Arts, um, which is the organization that employs me, and the Conseil Québécois des événements co-responsables. So they're very... Um, involved, we work together to make it a bilingual program and make sure that we have bilingual programming. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Qu did you mean ten for the panel or ten to qu ten minutes left in total? So we should move to questions. Oh, okay. So we're going to move over to questions. But I do feel like that was a beautiful place to just leave off this part of the talk because. Because really, and I think what you said earlier about the artists who started off, if I might just offer my own view, that, that started off the Hillside Festival, who were, who were ju just themselves very committed and it was integrated with the art they make. I think that's, I mean, music is in music or other arts. People are engaging on, obviously, um, with art and music and how they want to live. And, um, you know, if that's communicated through the entire event and the merch, um, you know, it can be pretty nice, <laughs> nice experience for everybody. It's an inspiring thing, I think, to work on, like, you know, and of course it's important given what's going on in the world, but it's uh, also a beautiful thing to achieve. So, um, uh, if that made sense. Um, so, shall we move over, move over to questions, question and answer period of this juncture um, event? So, uh, yeah, uh, do people have uh, questions they'd like to ask Devin or Laurence or Marie or me? If there have been any that have come in on a chat online, um, maybe you can also let us know up here. Kim Fry. Um, we have a microphone up here for questions and it's, I think it's just that one to the left. Is that correct? Just that one right there. Okay, super. I have a question. I mean, I could ask it later, but Devin, people might want to know, when you talked about the ticketing and incentives for people using um, active transportation or public transportation to get to shows, that's something we're talking about and working on a lot with Music Declares. But I've been trying to sort out, like, how do you make it actionable? And it seems like you made a, it, there's some examples of people that are doing this out there. Could you just talk about who's doing it and where? Um, just, yeah, we would love to know more concrete examples of that. Off the top of my head, I don't know if I can think of any actual names of, these are things that I've heard kind of anecdotally in okay. meetings, people telling me somebody's doing this, right. so I wish I could tell you. Okay. 
I'm very embarrassed that I can't. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a plan, and we'll find some, some people. Some but it, it, it right. also means that we, we still need to think about it and, and, yeah. and, yeah. and, and make it happen more. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if anybody is watching online and you're doing this, please email <laughs> Kim. <laughs> awesome. And me. CC me. Cool. Thanks. We actually did do something uh, where we had a car pooling uh, company from Quebec, and so we gave them a number of tickets that they could sell at a discount for people who were carpooling from Quebec to our festival in Ontario. Awesome. Interesting. So offering the discounted tickets to the people providing the better transportation so that they... Huh. Okay. Was it, was it complicated to organize and put in place? Or? Not really, no. Like, it's just a matter of, okay, we're selling them to you for this, and you sell them, but you have to sell them at a discount, and uh, that's that. I mean, I think if there were thousands and thousands of people yeah. purchasing them, then what you're doing is you're offloading an administrative thing on onto them, um, but there weren't thousands and thousands, mm -hmm. so it was, it was good. And it was a partnership, and, and we also knew that it was experimental. Yeah. We were going to try it for a few years, and it worked, so. That's really cool. It's a good idea. It's also something we're playing around with is offsetting your, you know, just giving giving people the option when they purchase tickets, having a little thing sort of saying, did you fly here, did you drive? And, you know, um, sort of you can roughly calculate how many kilometers and what that means in terms of your carbon footprint and then automatically offset it. Sometimes it's just like a, a buck or two or something like that. And do you want to do it here when you purchase your ticket? So. And we're playing around with that only because there's that whole thing about, I think, shaming that we're aware of, too. Like, when people want, they want to buy a ticket to the concert, they don't want to be told that they're getting there in a way that's maybe not so kosher. So we're, we're thinking about that a lot. And I think there's going to be more, I have a feeling more conversations about this are going to be happening yeah, in the next yeah, year or two, and we're going to start to see like <laughs> new norms maybe happening. Um, yes, yes, another question. I do have another question. Um, one of the things that's been on my mind a lot is that, you know, historically the arts kind of, we exist in our own little bubble, and of course we engage with communities and audiences, but it seems like now we really have to start working with people outside of the arts as well, and I just wonder if you have any examples of, of successful partnerships outside of our arts community. Um... I don't have anything on top of my, my mind, but I know that we've been talking lately to, for example, uh, Tio Taxis or Camino Tour are doing some partnership. So, uh, uh, you know, they did a, a, a tour uh, helping uh, Emile Bilodeau or Safiana Lai. Uh, so these kind of partnerships could be interesting in terms, like, uh, it's something that I also uh, thought about is like, okay, land transportation, knowing that it's better than flying, is still not the best, and I tried looking for, is there an ele electric van that I could land, and it's not available, so, so these kind of partnerships could potentially be interesting in terms of like artists traveling and, um, and uh, electric cars or stuff like that, um, uh, is something that I, but it's not like actively happening, but uh, it's just nice to, to, to see them coming to, to artists, also knowing that artists have an audience and have uh, a way of reaching people, uh, so th there's something there that is like slowly happening, maybe, hopefully. So yeah, it's I wonder if on the topic of like getting an electric van, like music declares emergency in response to that as well. I know we worked a little bit on um, uh, Kim Kim Fry here in the front row is with uh, as a board member of Music Declares Emergency with me. I wonder if you wanted to talk about at, at all the conversation you've had with about getting electric touring buses. Yes. Okay, amazing. Thanks. Yeah. So we've we've had some preliminary conversations knowing that audience travel is the biggest part of the pie. Um, and that musicians really feel like they they don't want to preach if they feel like what they're doing kind of isn't isn't doing the most, right? Like they don't want to be called out as being hypocrites. And that's a lot of the work that we're doing is like, well, you don't have to be perfect in yeah. order to be speaking about this. And um, knowing that the Canadian government 
has a zero emissions vehicle strategy and money set aside to help move Canada towards having electric vehicles. And knowing that just replacing every combustion engine vehicle with an electric vehicle is not the solution, like it's a whole complex suite of things, we're like, maybe there's a way to tie all this together. So we've talked in the Ministry of Transportation about could there be a partnership that develops of getting a fleet of electric tour buses and tour vans, which addresses the artist's concern of it being so expensive to tour across Canada right now. And if a band or an artist used that vehicle wrapped in a no music on a dead planet banner and they toured then they would get to use it for free in exchange for being very you know vocal about the fact that they're touring across Canada in an electric vehicle um, and and communicating to their audiences encouraging them to ride their bikes take public transit carpool and creating incentives of like if you show us proof then you'll get entered into a raffle where you'll get like a signed guitar or something, right? You know, like some kind of incentive that's really big and to kind of come up with a plan for that um, so that it addresses this biggest piece, which is the transportation piece. And if I think they're really visibly doing that, it, can, it helps the federal government in terms of their goals of promoting electric vehicles. We could work with venues because the venues would have to put in the fast charging electric vehicle charging stations so that when the tour bus rolls up, at say the Phoenix in Toronto or the TELUS Center in Montreal, the band goes on and it can get its charge so it can continue on the tour. So they're working with venues to install those and it's like kind of a great solution. So that would be awesome. Yeah, so those are the yes. kinds of things that we're <laughs> <laughs> trying to like get the people in the room for our Music Climate Summit in Toronto in a few weeks so that government's there too because a lot of these are policy issues and it's not even just the music industry that can do it on its own we need the political decision makers there as well because they're the ones who really control a lot of the transit policy and the active transportation policy yeah thank, thank you. you so much kim so yeah kim mentioned uh music declares emergency is co-hosting with some other organizations uh, uh canadian live music association uh, some other people pop montreal and um uh, yes, Pop Montreal has been big, um, helping, uh, working collaboratively, and um, Orchestras Canada bringing together a, a conversation of panels similar to this in, in Toronto, October 21st, with a concert in the evening. And uh, ho hopefully we can move that conversation forward. Maybe we'll get some politicians there, which is something that we're working on. Um, other questions or... I just wanted to address your question, just to say, um, yes, it is. It's a, it is a bit funny that you do have to go outside, um, but we've had success, and that it's an easy conversation now. It didn't used to be, um, but we had Toyota come on, and uh, we need Gopher cars that come uh, that leave our central communication zone and go and pick up, you know, lost artists or, you know, mustard or something, something that for some reason is not there. And um, so we didn't want those cars to be running in and out and, and uh, jacking up the footprint. And it just seemed, especially since they have to traverse the island, we wanted it to be an electric car. And so Toyota supplied them as part of a sponsorship for free. And uh, they insured the vehicles. They did everything. They were awesome. And, uh, and they didn't want a ton of fanfare. You know, I was sort of afraid that it was like they would ask us for, you know, stage naming rights or something. <laughs> but they didn't. They were just absolutely terrific. But there was somebody at that Toyota dealer who was a music enthusiast. And he saw the potential for there to be uh, a relationship. And it was totally respectful. It was really fun. And uh, they remain really great, great people. That's great to hear. That is so nice. That's a good story. Um, and interesting. Uh, more, more questions? Are there any questions that have come in through the chat? No? <laughs> okay. How are we, uh, uh, is it about time to wrap things up? We have a few more minutes. Maybe we'll just see if anything else pops into people's heads. <laughs> okay.
and if you're online and uh, couldn't hear, um, that was about uh, that was a uh, the question that was, I don't know your name, but that <laughs> Isabella was going to ask um, was similar to the first one about uh, like actionable ways to encourage different transportation to events, I guess. Although it's some nice nuances in the way you phrase that question. Um, but uh, there can also be more practical things like actually offering more bike parking or limiting the there amount of car parking or having like a, you know, a price for car park. You know, it's like um, you, you do have some control over um, or some people have some control over like what their site, mm -hmm. how to access the site. So it yeah, you know, right. There are ways. Like even just making sure you choose a site where there are options for people to arrive that are low carbon. Yeah. Yeah. And as much as possible, like public transport accessible. It's not always possible, especially in you know cities that don't have or towns that don't have great public transport. It's you know it's easy in Montreal because our yeah. our networks are so good. But yeah. Yeah. Um, it makes me think of, anyways, the festivals out in the country, like, how can they, how much do, would they be organizing, busing? Um, uh, well, it has been um, a really amazing conversation here today. I'm really thrilled that Pop Montreal is hosting this uh, series of workshops. It, I think it's fantastic. Um, personally heartening for me <laughs> um, and uh, thank you I want to thank Eve Parker Finley who has been amazing at helping I uh, get this um, panel together thank you so much and to the people here doing sound uh, um, and uh, to Jen Dorner from pop Montreal and also music declares emergency Kim Fry for your work on this and everybody here in the audience and at home um, it's uh, there's lots for us to think about and and do you? So, shall we say goodbye for now? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Have a good day. Thanks so much. Take care.